Well, because of these are constantly blocked, what happens is, uh, ironically, a, an, a play sets off the Cultural Revolution. So um, there's a play that's written, and um, one of the criticisms of the socialist education uh, uh, movement comes from the PLA. It's the head of the PLA. Um, I forget his name. It is. No, I don't have it here. But in any case, it's the head of the PLA. And he criticizes this method. And he's like, look, here's the thing. If you politicize the military, it's just going to tear it apart. And it's going to make it disorganized. And it's not going to work. Well, he was dismissed. So um, the uh, Wuhan is a deputy, deputy mayor of Beijing. And he writes a play, which is called Han Ru. Or uh, no, I'm sorry, Hai Rui. And the basic idea of this play is it's Hai Rui is this very good, you know, uh, you know, humble, hardworking bureaucrat in ancient China, and he's dismissed by this, you know, power mad and jealous emperor, right? Well, you know, initially it wasn't particularly politicized, but then there became uh, this interpretation of it, and Mao's wife Zhang Xing. And her ally, um, who was Yao uh, Wen Yuan, who was an upcoming, uh, he was an editor of a prominent newspaper in Shanghai, Shanghai being one of the most important industrial cities, published an article criticizing the play. And what they said is, look, this is really a play criticizing Mao for dismissing this army leader. And he shouldn't be criticizing Mao because, honestly, we should have political consciousness in our uh, People's Liberation Army. They should have education. And this is, you know, a cowardly attack by the capitalist rotors against Mao. Well, what happens? The Central Committee establishes uh, in February 12, 1966, so now we're starting to get into the actual Cultural Revolution. It's called the Five Man Group. And Mao calls for a revolution in Chinese culture to clean out all of these, this mess. All this feudalism, all this patriarchy, um, all this hierarchicalism. Um, and all of these terrible old ideas. So there's the five man group, which is to start this revolution in Chinese culture, and it really didn't do anything. Um, in fact, the only thing it tried to do is it tried to wind down the discussion on this play. And what, it, what its position was is, look, people, you know, this is just an academic work. This is just a work of art. It has no political intentions, and you're just trying to make it political. You're trying to make it about Mao and the, you know, the Deng Xiaoping and Lo Shou Chi and the army chief. It's not. It's just a play. So everybody needs to calm down. And that's it. Well, um, what happened is uh, this didn't go over very well. And in fact, it was seen as an attempt to stifle discussion. So in May, uh, so Mao uh, shows up to this committee, dissolves it. It says, you know what, you're not doing anything. You're done. And he establishes a new committee. On May 16th, so this is again, um, yeah, two months later, three months later, roughly speaking, sorry, I always look bad April. Um, Chen Boda shows up, and he becomes the head of a new group, which is the Cultural Revolution Group. So he's the head, but Zhou Enlai is going to function as the chair at their meeting, and he can speak for the groups without, or the group without consulting the group. Well, what's going on here with um, this group? It's established May 16th. Well, really important event happens, and this becomes the big character campaign, which is one of the most important events in the start of the Cultural Revolution. So keep in mind, the Cultural Revolution group is formally started on um, May 16th. So this could, could, right, any of these dates so far could be seen as the start of the Cultural Revolution. But here's where it kicks in. On May 25th, a philosophy teacher wrote out in big character posters uh, criticizing local party and university officials. He saw them as trying to suppress debate. And so he basically wrote, like, there are black capitalist gangsters in the party. And it's these big letters, and he posted them on the wall in, uh, on the university. Well, as you can imagine, they were not too pleased about this, and they began taking them down. Well, Mao found out about this, and what he actually did is he publicized this in the paper of these big posters, and he encouraged everyone to speak out with these big posters. Well, these big character posters um, quickly spread all over the country, and the, uh, you know everyone began participating in debates. 
They began posting their political views, attacking other political views, posting support for certain figures, you know, local or even national figures, um, and attacking other figures. So you had support for Mao, you know, attack Lo Shou Chi, um, and Mao himself even wrote uh, one, which was bombard the headquarters. And the idea being that there is a, a new corruption going on in the, the Communist Party, and it's the job of the working class to root it out. So um, something else really important happens on this. So this is just four days later. On May 25th, you have that, that poster. On May 29th, the secondary school, right, so this would be the high school, middle to high school, attached to Xinjiang University, which was a very important, prestigious, uh, technical and scientific university, um, wrote two letters that would become perhaps the most important two letters of the Cultural Revolution. They wrote Red Guards. And they identified their particular group that was writing these posters as the Red Guards. And in this case, they saw themselves as Red Communists guarding against the capitalist rotors. And so out of these high school students, the first Red Guards were organized, and these red, this Red Guard organization quickly spread independently as a grassroots movement throughout all of China. Well, um, what happened then? Red Guards began to go on every single level of education. You had Red Guards in the universities, you had Red Guards in the post-secondary, the high school, the middle school, and even in the elementary school. Now, the thing is, it was a grassroots movement. So quite frequently, the Red Guards disagreed, not only on how to interpret Mao's line, um, which was often held up as, you know, uphold Mao Zedong thought, um, but also against who was a revisionist, who was not a revisionist, who was a capitalist rotor, who was not a capitalist rotor. And in fact, um, you know, it went, their disagreements went from everything from street gangs fighting over territory to people criticizing or, or uh, debating and fighting, literally fighting in the streets over the proper uh, international response to things like the Vietnam War and everything and anything in between. And so yes, were there people who were uh, Red Guards who were just street thugs who wanted to carve out their own territory? Yes. But also there were people literally fighting and dying over whether or not um, you know, uh, Albania should be supported as a capitalist rotor or socialist rotor. And, any, and again, anything in between. So this spurred massive discussion about everyone. Everyone in the country was engaged in uh, political debates, in um, you know, writing these signs, and trying to determine what socialism would actually look like. Um, well, the thing is, Lo Xiu Qi and Deng Xiaoping were not big fans of this, because they were often targets, because their position was of efficiency. Uh, and I, I forget the exact quote by, um, I think it was, I think it was Lo Xiu Qi who said, it is better to buy than to manufacture, and it is better to rent than to buy. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but if I'm thinking about socialism, that sounds less like socialism, and that sounds more like the rent-to-own commercials, right, that you see all the time on late-night television. So they didn't really enjoy this, and there, you know, it was, it was a, quite a, a big faux pas directly attack Mao, so what they would say is, yes, yes, political organization, political discussion, so long as it doesn't interfere with your school or your job, right? Those are the most important thing. Mao went completely the opposite direction. In fact, there's this uh, famous story. He was talking to his niece, I believe, and his niece was a student, and she's like, I don't know what to do. People will not come to the the, 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 the cultural revolution meetings. They're not coming to our student meetings. And so, of course, you would expect Mao to say, well, you know, enforce them, you know, go talk to them and make sure they come. And he says, well, maybe your meetings are really boring. Or maybe they're at a time that nobody wants to go. Maybe they're tired. And in fact, you know, if, if people aren't showing up to your meetings, then that, that seems like it's more your problem than, than theirs. And he's, well, well, you know, a lot of these people aren't even studying hard. He says, well, why, why should they study hard? If the teacher can't make it even remotely interesting to them, why not sleep in class? 
I mean, they'll go to sleep, they'll wake up when class is over, they'll be refreshed, they can go fishing, they can go have political discussions. Uh, why, why shouldn't they sleep in class? Why should they you know, respect the teacher? The teacher should only be respected if the teacher is actually teaching. And so, I mean, this, you'll see that this is not simply just you know, Mao being a little wacky. This is a political line directly opposed to the efficiency of Deng Xiaoping and Lo Shou Chi. Right? And this sort of, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't even describe it in words, but this sort of uh, freedom, this sort of radical, radical experimentation um, was prevailing across the entire country. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. 